Yeah, so I, I always try and keep a mindset of what awesome stuff can I create from here? You know, what 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 cool possibilities are there for creating a cool sound? Uh, or, or, you know, what what are the possibilities of what could be done here rather than what needs to be done? What's up, producers? It's Sam Matler here, and you're listening to the EDM Podcast, a talk show where I interview successful artists, producers, engineers, and industry people. And today I talked to someone who I've been a big fan of for quite a long time. Uh, he produces under the alias JTech, who I'm sure you've heard of. If you haven't heard of JTech, I urge you to pause this and go check out some of his music before you listen because uh, that way you'll get an idea of how talented this guy is. JTech is a progressive house producer from Australia. He now lives in Germany, uh, in Berlin, and he's a key producer on Anjuna Beats. But he also runs his own label called Positronic, uh, which we'll hear a little bit about in this interview. He signed his first vinyl release at 16 years old, he's classically trained as a pianist, and he's just put out his third artist album called Awakening, which is uh, really awesome. I've listened to the whole thing, and I encourage you to do the same. We talk about a lot of stuff in this interview, uh, including why he started his label, uh, how to send your music to labels. James, or Jimbo, as he likes to be called, uh, used to do A&R for Anjuna Beat, so he has some great advice on that. Uh, We also talk about the benefits of having a classical background, how he starts a track, the importance of a professional mindset, keeping financially disciplined as an artist, which is uh, quite an important one, and also programming powerful bass lines, uh, among many other topics. So... It's a great interview, one of my favourite, and I'm sure you'll enjoy it. This episode is brought to you by EDM Foundations. EDM Foundations is my course for new producers, those who've been producing for under 12 months, or even those who've just started. The whole idea of the EDM Foundations course is that you learn the fundamentals of music production by actually doing and not just learning the theoretical stuff. The course consists of over 12 hours worth of streamable video where I walk you through the creation of three songs and give you advice and tips for working on your own original alongside them. We've had over 500 people sign up for this course. Many of them have had great results. If you want to learn more about the course, head over to edmfoundations.com. James, thanks for coming on the show. It's fantastic to have you on. Thanks, it's good to be on the show. Now, for those listening who who don't know you that well, uh, why not give us a bit of background? Who are you and how did you get into music? Who am I indeed? Um, (laughs) (laughs) It's the ultimate question, right? Um, I'm Jimbo. I'm from Australia. Uh, Originally from Australia, but now living in Germany. Um, I moved away uh, a very long time, about about seven years ago now. And, uh, yeah, so, uh, I've, I've been living in Germany for the last five years and basically my life at the moment is basically a mix of working in the studio, you know, uh, unraveling studio mysteries and working out how to make cool sounds in the studio and, uh, traveling around the world and DJing. Uh, so it's, it's a pretty nice lifestyle at the moment, uh, because, uh, I can sort of, I can really get lost in the studio here for sort of like a few weeks at a time and then I can and be all by myself if I need to be and, and focus on work. Um, and that's being in Berlin is a great place to be for that. And then, uh, you know, on the weekends I can, I can jet off to China for (laughs) for two days or, you know, I'm going to India for two days over new years. Um, and so, yeah, I live this, I live this kind of very, very, it's either very, very action packed or very, very, very chilled out lifestyle. Um, so I, I released music on the Anjuna Beats label, uh, as well as my own label, Positronic Digital, Mm. Uh, the, the label that I started, um, about a year ago, it's sort of been, um, coming in leaps and bounds since then. And I've just released my third artist album on Positronic. Um, and I also have a monthly radio show and podcasts where we showcase, uh, up and coming talent, uh, in the field of sort of melodic music and progressive house music. Uh, and that's been running for about seven years now and we're yeah. almost up to a hundred episodes of that. So it's a monthly show. And, uh, that's kind of been the, the bread and butter of, of, of my sort of career between all of the releases 
because it's a, it's a month in month out show where uh, the first hour is a mix from myself, a DJ mix from myself, and then the second hour is uh, a producer that's that comes onto the show. And so basically, uh, what started the the record label Positronic was basically we had we had so many people coming on the show and being, you know, being a part of our sort of online sort of progressive house community uh, through the podcast um, that we made sort of lots of connections with, with up and coming artists and very talented people whose music wasn't necessarily out there in the global sphere so much. And, uh, you know, Positronic is a way for us to take some of those artists under our wing and sort of help them develop things. Uh, so the way the label works basically is uh, in addition to sort of, putting out the music and promoting it and all that kind of stuff. We also give the artists a bit of an in-depth kind of hands-on um, sort of tutorials for a lot of stuff. I help with a lot of the post-production. So I do sort of STEM masters and stuff like that. Uh, and basically we sort of try and get the essence of the artists and sort of bring them out. Um, and basically my, my sort of passion for doing that came from working with Anjuna Beats where we did label A&R. I used to work in their studios in London and uh, we, did, we would do label a which was which was just and uh, doing sort of these mixed compilations and stuff that Anjuna release. There was so much sort of sifting through tracks and finding the gems and working out what was what was wrong with them, you know, why they didn't work, whether it was due to arrangement or, or the way or, you know, sound quality, stuff like that, you know, how it's going to work on a dance floor or that kind of stuff. Uh, so yeah, so for the last maybe 15 years now, it's been a bit of an obsession of mine. And yeah, uh, so yeah, I released my first record when I was 16 and I'm 30 now. So I, I think I've put out something like, um, I guess it would be like 30 or 40 releases, like single releases, wow. three artist albums and three or four mixed compilations as well. Man, that's, uh, that's incredible. And I want to talk about pretty much everything you mentioned uh, but I'm just curious, I get a lot of questions from producers who say, you know, I I feel like I'm at a point where I want to send my music to a label. I'm just not sure how to do it or I'm not sure how to structure the email. I mean, what advice would you give, given your experience uh, to, to someone like that who thinks you're ready to pitch their music to labels? Uh, I think sort of having a, an active role in the community is a very, very important thing. Uh, you know, like when I was, <laughs> when I was like 16 years old, I would put lots of uh, CDs in, in, in post packs and send them all around the world to record labels, hoping to hear something back. And I, I doubt anyone ever even opened them. Um, and it's the same actually when, when people give me a CD at a gig nowadays and say, you can check it out. And I'm like, Oh, look, I'll try, but it's actually really hard for me to find a device that can, play CDs nowadays. So, you know, um, and, uh, I think anyone who is a content provider nowadays, like a musical content provider is going to have a constant stream of new stuff. Um, so, I mean, I think the most important thing is to just present the music in, you you need to be mindful of the fact that the demo you're giving in is probably one of many that they're seeing that week. And Mm -hmm. so in that sense, the more concise, uh, and clear you can be about, you know, what it is that, that you're selling <laughs> musically, you know, what it is that you're bringing to the table and the more easy you can make it like for people to listen to. I think that's a very important thing. You know, people say stuff like I've seen record label execs say stuff like if you upload a track to, I think it's box.com or is it box.net? It's like a yeah, similar yeah. kind of service to Dropbox or whatever, you know, uh, people like those kind of links because it's a link they can click on and just play it right in the browser. Like I, it sounds really lazy on the, on the labels <laughs> side of things, but the more easy you can make the, the, the less difficulty somebody has actually accessing your music, the, the better it's going to come through. So, uh, you know, if I was to shop my music to somebody nowadays, um, I mean, obviously the process would be a bit different for me because now I have like a list of contacts that I could get in touch to help me do it. You know, yeah, yeah. The, the first thing I would suggest is not going in the front door. You know, if you know somebody in the, in the industry who is connected to that person, you know, that's a good, that's often a good way to do it. If you have somebody, a a middleman who can sort of vouch for you or sort of at least, you know, give some kind of indication that it's worth listening to, I think that that really helps. But otherwise just, just be like, you know, hi there. Like this is my new track. Uh, It's of this style. We're looking for, you know, uh, we're looking for, you know, somebody to license it basically. Mm -hmm. Um, I think if you're just straightforward about it and open and honest about it, um, then that at least means it will probably get listened to initially, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, because I think, most labels who have like an A&R a- 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 department, they'll usually have somebody doing the grunt work of going through each and every single track 
and you know filtering out the stuff uh, that is actually worth listening to to begin with. We certainly do that, and that's a, that's a necessary process, absolutely, because for one person to just go through each and every single track doesn't make sense, and it's a waste of time because a lot of them are attempts at tracks that they're, they're not ready for prime time, mm. and that's what people also you know uh, often do is they is they send stuff out as soon as they have something that they've finished, you know, they, they might've only finished one or two tracks or something and they're already kind of sending stuff out, but there's, mm. you know, there's still so many kind of things that they really need to learn before they're going to have, have a real impact, I think. So, you know, but I think, yeah, just being straightforward and honest about what you are and, and what you're going for. And, and I think maybe the other, the other thing I would say is starting with, uh, an imprint that is maybe appropriate for you in terms of size. You know, I think some yeah. people, often try to go straight for the big guys, you know, like this, for this idea of being picked up by like a big label and, you know, um, and sometimes to work with a world-class label, you do need to kind of work your way up the ranks a little bit. So I think in this day and age, in the digital age, there's certainly nothing wrong with working with an indie label who might be a bit more willing to take a chance on you. Um, and, you know, has a bit more freedom cre- creatively to release your stuff, uh, rather than, a big label who has a, a duty to their fans to release nothing but huge world-class records. So I think it's good to make a distinction between those two kind of labels as well. I'm kind of curious though. I mean, how often does that happen in the industry? A An unknown artist sends a track to a big label and it gets signed. Uh, look, I mean, it does happen. And, uh, I think it takes a special certain kind of talent, you know, mm-hmm. uh, but it, it's all about perspective. I mean, like I did a, um, I did a TV show theme pitch. Uh, I don't know if you know the, the expanse, the new sci-fi nice. series that, um, has just begun. And it's, it's, ba- it's kind of like the game of Thrones in space. It's like based oh, this cool. big series of books. And I was reading the books on a plane one day and I was like, Oh, like I'm so inspired by this like story. I want to go write like a, and I found out they were writing a TV show, a theme song. So I was like, oh, sorry, they're writing a TV show. And I was like, oh, all right, I want to see if I can, you know, pitch them in like a theme song. So I wrote this like TV sci-fi, like TV um, theme for them and sent it off. And um, so I actually just saw the first episode of the finished, pro- like the, the, it was a huge production. I didn't realize how huge it was actually. I think they spent like a hundred million dollars like producing this show. Wow. And they have, you know, like their own kind of in-house composer and, and orchestras playing and all, all this kind of stuff. And um, so I actually, I actually saw the first episode of that Um the, just the other day and uh, only the only episode one actually has like a long opening sequence. Mm. Uh, but when I saw that, I was kind of like, Hmm, I feel a bit silly for having sent that in now. You know, it's like, I was I just, this, I was just this random dude, Yeah. you know, as far as, you know, sending getting in touch with this big product production company in LA. So, you know, um, so I felt a bit silly in a way for sort of, cause I sort of, once I saw the, the finished product, I was like, ah, actually that, that theme song that I did, like probably would not have fit in with the, sh- the show at all, you know, but I'm still glad that I did it, you know, like there, there's nothing to lose. Yeah. But, you know, it was still like, it was still a cool experience in terms of writing the track. And even though it might not have necessarily fit the bill, it was still worth doing, I think. Yeah, no, for sure. Uh, now I want to, I want to go back a bit. You said you released your first record at 16. Uh, yep. but I mean, what got you into music? Was there a certain song you listened to? Was it a person? I mean, what, what sparked it off? Uh, well, I was always kind of on the musical path. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I was like five years old, my auntie and my mom got me into playing piano and they were really encouraging at the time. And I think, um, I really do believe that if you're, if you're really, really, really young and impressionable and you have people saying like, yes, you've got this talent, you know, you should, you should go and develop it. It's sort of, I think that gives you the inspiration to go and actually, you know, turn it into something real, you know? And so even though I was sort of like five, six, seven years old, you know, people were say, you know, people were always telling me, oh, you're, you're so good at, you know, playing the piano, James, even though it was probably like, you know, really, really simple stuff and, you know, but I, I, I guess I had an ear for it. And, um, then I used to go on piano competitions and Estedfords and stuff in Australia uh, and very high pressure kind of performance environments um, very early on, you know, but back when I was like 10, 11 years old and uh, I won a few sort of medals and stuff, you know, I, would, I, I wasn't one of those kind of, you know, like some kids uh, in these competitions, they just win first place in every single thing and they practice, yeah. you know, eight hours a day or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I was not disciplined enough for that. And so basically uh, throughout school, I was only really good at German and music. They were like the two things that I sort of did all the way through to the end of high school. And, um, yeah, uh, 
where was I going with this story? Sorry. Yeah. Um, and so I was, I was heading for a classical music kind of background basically. And, uh, that kind of went all the way to the start of university where I started like a bachelor of music. But by that stage, I had already discovered kind of like Euro dance and like pop music. And I was just starting to get into like the sounds of trance as well. And, uh, so yeah, you know, I basically dropped out of university to follow a, a like a, a sort of trance career and that kind of changed um a little bit when I discovered Progressive House. And Progressive House felt like a sort of a little bit more grown-up version of the same thing. It felt like mm. you know the, the parties were a bit smaller and the music was a little bit more forward thinking, you know. It was it was a little less explosive, but it was a lot it went a lot deeper for me somehow. And uh at that time in Australia there was an epically huge uh, boom in underground dance music around the whole country. This was around sort of 2002 to 2003. Um, and we, you know, we just had all the biggest names in kind of progressive house at the time and global progressive house uh, coming through Australia. And I was just, you know, I was lucky enough to see all these DJs who were kind of heroes of mine, um, you know, just and coming through every single week. And so pretty shortly after that, I moved to the UK uh, after I signed my first record with Engine Beats and they sort of said, you know, there's room over here for you if you want to move over, you know, we can help you get set up, we can introduce you to life in the UK, you can come and work in the Above and Beyond studios. Uh, and so, yeah, that's how it all began, basically. And it's awesome. And, you know, you've got this classical background. Do you feel that that's helped you uh, in terms of electronic music production? Yeah, definitely. I, I think if I had not had the classical background, I would be more of a techno producer or something, you know, I feel, I feel like, I really do feel like that's the, that's the distinction between house yeah. music and techno music is that house music does adhere to more traditional styles of, of, of composition. I also think that techno is free of that a little bit as well. Like it's always, you know, it, it can be also kind of good to not have those, have any kind of constraints on, on how you actually create the music. But what, the classical background is good for is melody and harmony and chord progressions and stuff like that. And so for me, you know, one of the most important things in my music generally is the chord progression, uh, because to me, that's the storytelling element of the song. And, um, it's melody and harmony to me is like a, is like a, is a musical language. It's like a spoken language that the more vocabulary you learn, the more you can express with it. And so I think that's been the sort of the lifeblood of my music is, the, is this classical background um, and the music theory and all that, all that kind of stuff, all these, you know, um, and also have playing piano as well uh, because it's helped that helps. And, you know, doing improvisation and stuff uh, as a pianist, it helped me kind of conceptualize an idea in my head and work out what that idea would be in terms of notes. And so that's kind of given me the ability to, I can really, I can, I can listen to any song out there and I can go and musically transcribe it nowadays. You know, I don't have to think about how to create a certain sound, you know, mm -hmm. anymore. And, uh, that would, that is kind of the same case with the electronic production now as well. And so that's what ultimately made me made the switch, make the switch was that with sort of traditional, the traditional background that I had, you were always limited to one instrument or, you know, the same types of instruments again and again. Whereas with electronic production, you can use any sound in the world to make what you're making. And so that's what really interests me about it. So you say that, you know, harmony and melody are, are the most important things. In terms of workflow, I mean, when you start a track, is that what you start with? I mean, do you sit down at, at a piano and, and start writing or does it change every time? In terms of starting the track, coming up with that initial idea. Yeah, I mean, it's it's really different every time. And uh, I keep telling myself that I should have a bit more of a framework uh, for the tracks that I that I make. <laughs> but that, that never actually seems to happen. <laughs> yeah. You know, like I would, I would like to be able to, you know, uh, on a more regular basis, I would like to be able to say, right, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to write a track that is 126 BPM or whatever, and is in this key and it's, it's going to do this and it's going to have a breakdown like this. Uh, but I think even when I try and do that, it ends up sort of becoming whatever it wants to become. So I have a very sort of, uh, go with the flow kind of musical process basically. And so how it usually starts uh, nowadays is that I collect sounds from places like splice sounds and, uh, Reddit actually is another good place to collect free samples. Mm. Um, splice sounds is a service that 
you pay, I think, I, I can't remember how much it is. It's, it's like five or 10 bucks a month or something. And you get like a hundred download credits uh, per month. And it's basically like a beat port for samples. And so with splice wow. sounds, basically I get a hundred new sounds that I've handpicked from all of these different collections, such as drum loops and, you know, uh, effects and crash symbols and, you know, just, and little vocal chop samples and stuff like that. Um, and so every month I have like a big pool of new, of new audio basically. And so, uh, how a project usually starts for me is in Ableton, just getting some of this stuff out of this, out of the browser and just throwing it in there and seeing what works. <clears throat> and that's a, that's a really fun way to do things. I think because, um, the music tends to kind of the, 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 the structure of the music tends to sort of create itself, you know, rather than thinking like what kind of melody do I, you know, you, you, it might work to sort of come up with something on the piano and whistle it and then find an instrument for it. But I find if you actually start throwing some, some pre-made samples together, that instantly generates inspiration for, you know, the instruments that you can then add in, you know, it gives, it gives you the, the basis to, to, yeah. to get things going, you know? So you have like a kick drum in there, you have a snare drum in there, you have some cool, you might have like a little, little loop, like a little music loop that's like sampled from an old record or something. And then that'll give you an idea for a baseline to go with it. And so, you know, uh, then it's just a matter of doing whatever works, whatever kind of flows well. And so at the moment I'll do like maybe two or three different projects at the same time. Okay. Um, sometimes uh, it might be, one chilled out track, one dance track, and then maybe say a mix project for somebody else. And so if I ever hit sort of a creative block, I just instantly switch gears and switch to a different project. And so I usually, I usually complete sort of two or three things at the same time. And that, that is a system that really works for me. And I feel that way. You're not just banging your head against the wall, trying to, <laughs> trying to get past a certain point in the track. Yeah. Um, and so uh, another thing that I find is really cool to do uh, is every single time that I work on a, on a project, um, I'll save it as a new file, I'll mute everything out, and then I'll bring the elements back in one by one um, in the order of how important they are to the overall song and how much I like them. So, you know, I bring back in like the kick and the bass and, and you know, maybe one of the main kind of melodic elements and sort of you know, get into the groove with that and then sort of see what I want to bring in. You know, it, I asked myself the question, if the track had to be just three parts, like which part three parts would it be? And then if it had to be just four parts, what would the next thing that I'd be bringing be? And so on and so forth. And, uh, what you often find doing stuff like doing it that way is it shines a spotlight on what you actually don't love about your song, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which, which tracks yeah. you don't actually like that much. Uh, and so generally with a track, like, it, you know, if there's no real specific direction that it absolutely has to go in, uh, what ends up happening with that process is that every iteration kind of goes in the, off on a bit of a different direction musically. Uh, and ultimately you get to a point where you have a mix that's, that's full of stuff that you like. And so that's, that's a process that I kind of developed over the, over like the last few years. And lately it's worked really well. Yeah, that's, that's really cool. And two things come to mind. I mean, you mentioned using the samples and starting with just, you know, dragging stuff in. And I have to say the most enjoyable production sessions for me have been when I've just been, you know, scrolling through sample packs, come across like, it might, it might just be a vocal chop and it forms the basis for a full track. Um, yeah. It's those kind of sessions that I love. And the other thing, you know, you mentioned muting everything and bringing it back in. Uh, I like that because I feel like a lot of, a lot of producers, especially new producers, uh, you know, it's easy to get carried away and add a load of unnecessary stuff in, uh, which just clutters up the project. And yeah. it can be a good kind of, uh, I know personally, like I, if I'm five hours into a project and uh, there's a lot of stuff going on, a lot of tracks, it can get to the point where it kind of just doesn't sound that good and I'm kind of losing interest. And I think doing that, I, I do a variation of that where I kind of, uh, just objectively look at the track and delete things that aren't really making a significant or aren't playing a significant part. Doing that can kind of bring it back to its core and you can work on it from there, uh, which really helps. Um, cool. Now, I, I was reading an interview when I was doing research for this on your EDM, I believe, uh, where you were talking about the switch you made from Anjuna Deep to Anjuna Beats. And you mentioned that it helped you realize the importance of a professional mindset when it comes to production. 
but I'm curious as as to what you meant by that a professional mindset. Uh, well, I think you have at some point you have to make the jump from making an attempt at a record <laughs> to making a record, mm. and to make a record, you know, uh, to really sort of make an effective record is a very very multifaceted process, and it's it's something that requires just a lot of wisdom and a lot of experience. And you also just need to make a lot of music and make a lot of mistakes mm. uh, in order to narrow down what it is that actually makes something really special. And some of the most important aspects I would say are like the musicality of it. Does the musical message make sense? Um, sound design, sound quality, how it's going to translate to audiences uh, for, you know, like, you know, do I have five things happening in this track that, that only that people are only going to hear two of or, and also how it works on the dance floor, which is, which is a very important one as well. Uh, because sometimes you, you have a track finished in the studio and you have this picture in your mind of, of what it's going to be like, uh, when you play it out on a dance floor. And then when you actually go and play it out on a dance floor to all of these people who are watching you and, you know, waiting for something it's magical to happen. Um, sometimes it can, it can suddenly like, it can, it can be like being thrown into a, into a cold pool or something, you know, it's like, it's like suddenly it's a hundred times more real than you expected it to be. So it's just stuff like that, you know, um, it's just, you know, f firstly having a good kind of, um, concept of, of what it is you're going for with your music. I think that's a really important thing. Uh, sort of working out what your sound is, refining that sound, and then making sure that you're delivering the best, best version of that sound to the world. And, um, yeah, you really need to experiment with a lot of stuff to get that right. I think. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, now I really want to talk about your, your latest album, but before that, uh, you've got a mixing and mastering service that you also do along with, running a label, playing gigs, and working on production. I mean, you know, two questions here. How do you manage to fit all that work in? And uh, the second question, tell us, it's not really a question, tell us about your mixing and mastering service. Um, that's, that's uh, yeah, there's, there's a few things to cover there. Um, I think, uh, firstly, uh, I am a little bit overworked. You know, like I'll happily, I'll happily admit that. Like, yeah. um, and that's more of, you know, I don't have, um, official management. I more so have like a team of inner circle kind of people doing stuff, you know? Uh, uh, so, you know, a, a lot of stuff that happens in my career, I kind of have to make happen myself. You know, I have to be the one who's sort of staying on top of people and, you know, making sure things actually sort of work out the way that they're supposed to. Uh, running the label is actually not so hard because we have a good system in place. For starters, I run it with my business partner, Dion, who lives in Australia. He is a marketing guru and a longtime JTEC fan. And we've been friends since I was about 17 years old. And, uh, so that's kind of our little love child is, is, is the Positronic label. And, uh, so we have it set up through label engine. It's mostly digital. We do some physical product as well. Uh, so that's actually, now that that's been running for a year, you know, we've got an in-house designer, we've got, we've got the distribution set up. That's actually not that hard. It doesn't take that much time. Um, so yeah, basically the mixing and mastering service came about cause I was doing it for so many other producers. Anyway, I do it in my radio show pretty much every month. I have to remaster something somehow because progressive house is a, field of music that generally has a very low standard of production quality because of really? the fact that everybody's still learning. Oh, okay. And, um, well, like, yeah, I, I mean, I think a better way to put it is it's got a very varied spectrum of production quality. Right. You know, you have, a, you yeah. have a lot of tracks that, uh, sound okay at home, but aren't going to work in a club or, you know, you have things that are just maybe pushed way too hard or not pushed hard enough. Um, it, it's very variable, you know, mm -hmm. there aren't many, there aren't many sort of standards that people to adhere to generally if they're sort of up and coming producers. Um, so, you know, I, like my studio is kind of, I, I've been tweaking it for, this is my, uh, third studio space in Berlin and uh, I've been tweaking it for about a year. And, uh, you know, I've sort of, <laughs> I've done lots of like, the room is like a kind of acoustic bubble, you know, it's, um, it's got one completely acoustically isolated 
wall, it's got a floating floor and everything is just kind of, you know, um, measured to the, to the centimeter kind of thing in terms of like speaker placement and acoustic treatment placement and all that kind of stuff. And, um, it took me a long time to really, really nail that sound. And, uh, you can never really truly nail the sound in a room. You always have to, you always have to make some kind of compromise and you have to have, you have to rely on other systems as well. Um, so yeah, you know, I, I had tried so many different combinations of things, so many different combinations of mixed styles for my own music over the last 10 years as well. And I see my studio as a kind of lab for testing all of this stuff out, um, for the Positronic collective compilation. It was like a two disc, uh, mix compilation that we put out last year. We signed something like 24 artists. Sorry, that was earlier this year, my bad. Um, and for that, I did about maybe... I'd say about seven or eight STEM masters for other people where, you know, basically they send me the track split into, um, you know, the sort of seven or eight main sections and I just help them with some post-production stuff. Um, anyway, so, and, uh, yeah, basically doing my last album, uh, it, it was really, I wanted to get my sound to, to a much sort of high level than it had been up until that point. And so like, it was a sort of three year journey of, of really improving the way that I do things and working out what really, really works, uh, you know, processing wise and what doesn't basically. And so, yeah, it, it kind of fits into my workflow anyway, because as I was sort of saying, you know, I can usually just weave it into whatever pile of stuff I'm doing. Um, and so it actually works out. Okay. Yeah. It's been pretty cool. So, you know, if people want to take advantage of this, how can they get in touch with you? Um, well, my service at the moment is hosted on soundbetter.com, which is basically at the site. Yeah, it's a site that hooks people up uh, with, you know, post-production, uh, music for games, music for film, uh, it, you know, people who need a, a backing track for their uh, vocalist or for remixes or whatever. It's, it's a place to connect with audio professionals. Uh, so you can find me on there. You go to soundbetter.com and I believe you click browse freelancers. Mm. And in the left-hand sidebar, you can search by provider name. And I'm there as JTech. Awesome. Cool. Uh now, your album Awakening, you mentioned that it took three years to make, which is a bloody long time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I listened to the whole thing and I have to say, I, I was impressed at the level of quality, but also uh, the diversity and the amount of experimentation, you know, that went on. Uh, what led you to create the album and were there any major creative challenges that you came across? Um, well, the album basically... Uh the concept for it came about because I wanted to tell a story. The first two albums had been sort of just explaining to the world what, you know, what my sound is all about, you know, like the, my first album especially was just to sort of just marked my place in the, in the kind of scene. And then the second album was just an exploration of, of, of a bunch of different styles. Um, so the third album I wanted to, I wanted it to have some kind of narrative and that was to paint a picture of a bright future which I believe we're all ultimately headed for, you know, as, as people come together with technology and as the internet kind of unites the world, you know, I, I really do feel like we're on the dawn of, of a completely new era that we can't even really imagine. You know, I think over the next sort of 10, 20, 30 years, I think things are going to become exponentially more amazing than they've ever been before, you know? Um, and so, yeah, I basically, uh, I wanted to, convey that with a kind of a hopeful message that would also kind of paint a picture of my own future. You know, I, I think it was also a kind of uh, me sort of writing, writing the future that I wanted for myself as well. And so the album cover, it's this little robot guy um, who is made of camera parts. It's basically, it's like a, it's like a bunch of sort of camera lenses and cameras and, and stuff like that um, all arranged on, on a, on a kind of, <laughs> digital operating table and it's basically arranged in such a way that it, it forms a little robot guy who's who looks like he's kind of opening his eyes for the first time like he's like yeah. he's just coming online and um yeah so i think it's yeah that, that it's got that deep hidden meaning for me of, it, of being my own kind of personal waking but it also kind of tells that external story as well um so yeah and i guess the reason it took three years is because the the whole music world completely transformed during the making of it you know we we really did go from sort of dance music 1.0 to kind of EDM to like what, whatever it is now, you know, it was this yeah. huge, huge, like the whole, the whole industry was completely turned on its head basically as the focus moved from UK, Europe over to the USA. Mm. And, um, so yeah, so there was a lot of material that I just, you know, I had kind of got to the finish line with the material, but I actually sort of realized that it sounded like something that sort of belonged in album number two and wasn't going to, 
wasn't going to make enough sense, you know, in this new musical world that we're in. Um, so that was, you know, a big part of it. That was, a, you know, having to reinvent myself a little bit as well, you know, having to become, have to, having to change the definition of what my music is about in order to sort of, you know, um, not just keep up with the, with the music world, but also to, to be a part of it. You know, it's like, I, 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 the, the platform has definitely changed between album number two and number three, put it that way. Um, but in completing it, it's also given me the freedom to get back to my roots. If that makes sense. Like yeah. it's given, you know, it's sort of, it's sort of shown the world that I can sort of do these different styles and I can sort of evolve my sound to sort of wherever it really wants to go. And, um, the feedback from, from people has been generally, uh, the people who were very, very like, into my music, like from the very, very beginning who were into sort of like my sort of album one and stuff like that were, were a little bit sort of taken aback by it at first. They were, they were a little bit like, Whoa, you know, this isn't, this is kind of what we we're expecting. Um, but it also like won all these new fans as well. And what was really good is that when the album actually came out, it felt like all of the people who were initially not quite convinced went and checked it out and then went, Oh, okay. Now that we've actually listened to this, like start to finish, like this, sound like album number three from Jimbo, you know, it was this yeah, like, yeah. yeah. So, um, so yeah, it was, it was kind of scary to put it out for sure actually, because you know, uh, it is sort of unveiling a new side of my sound that had not sort of really been explored before. Uh, but in the process, I think, you know, I, I think I've really solidified, you know, what I'm all about and yeah. So I'm pretty excited about where it's going to go from here. You know, I think also to have this project, project wrapped up, you know, everything that I've learned from it, you know, everything that, everything that it gave me in terms of, you know, print, like the skills, like production wise and musically, um, it's given me a much better idea about, about what I want out of my sound as well. Right. For sure. Uh, and I saw you post a status on Facebook about the album and someone commented, they made, you know, the typical, typical comment about how you've sold out or something like that. And you replied with one of the best comments I've ever read, uh, on this topic. And I just want to read out the first paragraph because it's it's awesome. You said, uh, I think I speak for a lot of artists who regularly receive comments like this when I say that a musician's work is completely and inextricably linked to the time period they are in, what is happening around them in their life, who they are as a person at that point in time, and what they enjoy musically constantly ebbs and flows like the weather and ultimately shapes the music they make. Our art fluctuates and so do the types of people who enjoy it. Um, man, I read that and I was I was blown away. It made so much sense. Uh, and I think it was just the best way to handle a comment like that. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, there's always going to be people who have this idea in their head of, of what the next thing from you is going to be. And... Uh, you know, often, I mean, this is something I've, I've found for years is that firstly, people just take it the wrong way. People, people sort of assume the worst. They see this new direction and they assume, they assume the most negative outcome of that direction, you know? Uh, and they also assume that it's like a, like a, like a permanent thing. They assume that it's like, you know, this is the way that, you know, they've they've decided to sell out. And this is, this is, this this is day one of their like 10 year journey into like maximum 900% selling outness, you know? (laughs) Um, so yeah, and it, it's not like that at all, you know. And unfortunately, it, you can't really listen to either side of the fence too much, you know. Right, just yeah. as as much as you can't listen to somebody saying, you know, if somebody comes to you on Facebook and is and approaches you in, in quite an unpleasant way, you know, people people in the industry will say, don't listen to them. Listen to what the fans in general are saying. Listen to what the numbers are saying. Listen to what the industry is saying. At the same time, if somebody compliments you and says, this is the best thing in the whole world, you can't really take that. Like you can't have too much of a big head about that either. You need to be yeah. sort of of the mindset of, you know, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm glad that it's having that effect on you, you know, uh, but ultimately what the, the real feedback that you need to pay attention to is from the people in your inner circle, from your peers, from the people who know your music well, you know, and my sister is actually one person who, listens to pretty much everything <laughs> that I make and she will have no hesitation telling me if she thinks something is crap and <laughs> it's totally fine. You know, yeah. she doesn't do it in, in this, you know, in she does, she does it in a totally honest way. And, um, she's such a good resource because she's not connected to the, to the production process at all. She doesn't, she's, you know, she doesn't have a concept of the nuts and bolts, you know, she's just hearing the end product, you know? So that's, that's what you need. I think you need, you need constructive criticism from the people who, who know who you are. 
Yeah, yeah. And aren't afraid to hold back. Now, now one thing that stands out to me in many of your tracks, uh, especially the more recent ones, is your bass lines. How do you approach bass line programming and do you have any tips for producers who struggle to make powerful bass lines? Um, I would say make sure that the bass lines hit at the right frequencies that are pleasing to the ear. And this goes for other sounds too, uh, mm. you know, snare drums, things like that, kicks. Um, say, for example, uh, if you have a bass line, you know, like I see, I, like, I see a lot of bass lines that sit around sort of like uh, above 100 hertz, for example, you know, uh, and there's this sort of 120, 130 hertz kind of muddiness zone. Uh, and there are a lot of tracks or a lot of bass lines where if you just mute out all of the treble information and you just have like just the very, very low sub frequencies playing, there's not very much going on. Uh, so something that I usually do that tends to work best in the actual construction process of the track is have an extremely simple sub bass and then a storytelling bass playing the same pattern. And that way you have, you can have a, say for example, like a bass that, you know, is more of a kind of melodic line that's up in like sort of lower mid frequencies and all the way up to sort of 800, a thousand Hertz, you know, whatever. Um, and then that can be as crazy as, as you like in terms of like how hard it's pushed or how much it's, you know, uh, what kind of tone it has, um, you know, how noisy or aggressive or, or, or pleasing it is or whatever. But if you have that sub bass that is just extremely simple and clean, then your low end is, is automatically going to just sound, uh, really good. So a lot of people use like a, a sine wave. I, you know, um, I use like logic's ES one bass a lot for that. Uh, like, ES1 is a very, very simple sort of instrument within Logic, which just has a perfect, like, sign kind of bass, you know. Uh, if you have Xfer Records Serum, you can also do it with, like, the sub feature in that. There's a direct mix uh, feature in the sub of, uh, of Serum, which will allow you to have a crazy bass sound with a cool sub uh, that's not processed uh, with the rest of the sound. It's just playing alongside it. Um, so, yeah, basically, you want to have, like, clean sounds in the, in the very, very, very low end, uh, and you also want to make sure that there's space in the mix for it. That's a really important thing as well is, is, you know, you want to keep that low end pretty, pretty free for, uh, you know, your kicks and bass and stuff like that. At the same time, that said, uh, a lot of people remedy this by high passing absolutely everything in the mix, which I don't really think is such a good thing to do either. I think that's something you should do, uh, when you, it feels like it really needs to be done to a particular sound. Um, but yeah, so, I mean, generally apart from that, it's about just having a good pattern and having an instrument that actually fits really well into the mix. So, uh, that's another thing that is, I think a, it, it's a, it's an acquired kind of skill, uh, of choosing a sound that actually really, really, really fits in, uh, into the mix with everything else, you know, and, um, you can usually tell if a track doesn't fit so well in the mix, if you mute it out and suddenly everything just becomes a lot more easy to listen to, you know, uh, so yeah, I think it's, it's it's mainly about just choosing the right sounds and keeping that low and super simple. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, now, other than working on you know two or three projects at once, like you mentioned, do you have any other routines, habits, or tricks that help you overcome creative block or creative rise? Um, I think there's yeah, there's a, there's a number of things to do that. I, th- I think that the number one reason people have creative ruts in the first place is because uh, they have the track up to a certain point and they're like, Oh, what's, what am I supposed to do next? You know, I think that's, that's the biggest source of a creative, right? Mm-hmm. And, uh, the problem with that is that you're looking at the whole thing in terms of limitation. You're looking at like what it doesn't have. And, um, yeah. So I, I always try and keep a mindset of what awesome stuff can I create from here? You know, what, what, what cool possibilities are there for creating a cool sound, uh, or, or, you know, what, what are the possibilities of what could be done here rather than what needs to be done? Yeah. Uh, another reason that people have creative ruts is because, um, they feel a certain pressure to succeed or to hit a certain target or to have a certain outcome for themselves as a result of the music. You know, if you're, if you're producing to pay a rent or if you're like trying to really, really hard to, to, fit within a certain label sound or you're, you know, you're, or you're doing it because you, you want to appear a certain way. Um, that can often actually stifle the music. It can stop the music from really going to its, to its full, to it, to it, to the full extent that it can. Uh, and so, yeah, I always tell people try and produce the track as if somebody's just given you a million bucks and three weeks off your job. Uh, <laughs> and you, 
have you have a villa in the Bahamas somewhere or, or <laughs> on a pizza, for example, and uh, the only uh, the only uh, outcome that you need to have by the end of that three weeks is, is having had a great time making whatever the hell you want music wise. You know, whatever you would make in that situation is is the best music that you can go and write. Basically, yeah. that's what you need to go and make. Uh, and that's a hard thing to do sometimes because especially if people expect a certain sound from you, you know, and this is what I found with the album as well is that, um, you know, I think if people were expecting a sort of start to finish progressive house uh, kind of thing, compendium, <laughs> then I think that's, that's where people were sort of most, you know, uh, surprised, I think was that, you know, it kind of, um, it goes, you know, there, there are lots and lots of different styles in there basically. So, you know. yeah. but I really feel that, like, you know, sometimes you have to let the music sort of decide what it wants to be. Uh, you, you can, you can give it a framework for sure. You know, you can, you can set some limitations and some limitations can be good. You know, uh, you can say, I only want to have five tracks in this project, for example, or, you know, I want to make sure that I only have like three things that people actually can are listening to at one time, you know, or I want it to be in a certain key, you know, you can do stuff like that, but ultimately you, you need to let it sort of develop into what it's going to develop because usually it's beyond your imagination, you know, it's, it's yeah. beyond what you conceived at the, out, at the outset. Another thing I do is I use uh, the Toggle Timer app. It's like a really, really simple iPhone app. And it's basically like you start a timer and it says, what project are you working on? And you say, I'm working on this club mix of Tiny Love or whatever. And then you work on that for an hour or something. And then, uh, and that, and then that way I just keep like a, a log of like all the time that I spend on each project. I don't actually need that information for anything, but somehow I feel like if I'm on the clock, you know, if the clock's ticking, then it's some, you know, kind of keeps me in that headspace of like, right, I'm here to work. I'm, I'm spending the next hour, like getting things done on this, on this mix basically, you know, uh, but it can also be a good way to see, um, you know, if things are dragging on too long as well. If you've been trying, if you've been trying to fix a mix for, for a week or something, then <laughs> something, something fundamentally wrong with the sounds that you're using, for example. What three pieces of advice would you give to upcoming producers? Um, the, <laughs> the first one would be save your pennies. <laughs> uh, like fi- finances are very, very important that like, you really need to keep, keep an eye on, on how much every, your whole venture is costing and how much you're actually making out of it. Uh, because it's a very sort of, it's, it's a roller coaster ride financially music, you know, uh, yeah. you might have a lot of work or a lot of gigs, you know, one month, and then you might feel like you're really ahead with money. And so you'll spend a lot more money and then you might find three months later that, you know, gigs are very, uh, uh, very light and, you know, and suddenly you're, you're hurting for cash and, you know, we, that's the, the like producers and musicians and just art, artistic types in general just don't really have the luxury of knowing, you know, the, the kind of dollar amount that they're going to make in a particular year, you know, it just changes all the time. And, uh, so there's, there's a few facets to that. I think it's important to have people, making sure that you're getting paid the right amount of money. You know, if, if, if there's something that other people are going to profit off a lot, you know, then you should be making something out of it as well. I think a lot of DJs certainly will tell you that they've done some pretty like crazy gigs for free and for the exposure and stuff like that. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, you know, like, you know, if you, if you value your time, you know, then, then other people should value it as well. And yep. yeah. And so, yeah, I would just sort of suggest, uh, you know, find, find ways to keep a career within your budget, you know, and it doesn't, doesn't have to be a case of, you know, owning a big studio or having outboard gear or anything like that. If all you've got is a laptop and a little pair of speakers, then, you know, you you can make it work, you know, and, uh, that's actually, that leads me on to my next point is don't blame your equipment. (laughs) Uh, it's about making the best stuff that you can with what you have. Sometimes the best, music is created on some of the most extraordinarily simple setups. Uh, I actually went into the, uh, splice, uh, it's it, as well as splice sounds, which I, which I mentioned before splice is a service, which allows you to back up, um, uh, all your files into the cloud. And, yeah. uh, you can also actually check out other people's projects on there. So you can go onto splice and you can look at, um, you know, projects from some of these like kind of heavy hitting EDM guys. I think Tiesto has got some projects up there and stuff and, and, uh, you can download the project. And if you actually go and check out some of these projects, you'll be amazed at how extraordinarily simple everything is. Like, uh, they'll all use, you know, they will be Ableton projects and they'll use the stock EQs and the mastering chain will be like 
and Ableton multiband compression and an Ableton limiter, you know, like really, really, really simple stuff. And so I think people get, you know, people get very, uh, very, uh, lost in that whole kind of frenzy of like, I need to add more kind of yeah. things into, into, you know, I need to add more plugins or I, or my plugins aren't doing what I want. But, uh, which leads, leads me on to my kind of third point is, um, and one of the best pieces of advice that I ever got was learn how to use all of your tools properly so that you can look beyond them and into the music, you know, like you, you actually want the, the technical details of, of things to stand in the way of what you're doing as, as little as possible. Mm. And I had a good, I had a really interesting chat with Boom Jinx, who's a fellow producer on the Anjuna Beats label recently. And he said, if you want your track to sound really good, you know, as far as the processing goes and that kind of stuff, the secret is for the music to be really, really special. Because if you have the music really, really good, all of the other stuff around that will, will fall into place around it. So that's a really important thing as well, I think. I, I like that last point. I suppose in a sense it's like getting this, the technical details or the ability to use certain plugins into the back of your mind, into the subconscious you know, section of it so that you can focus on the music. Instead of having to, uh, you know, I remember earlier on uh, when I was a, a new producer, having to look at a track and go, okay, I need to add compression. How on earth do I do that? But over time, it kind of becomes a subconscious process where you add a compressor, you know exactly what to do. Uh, and you can kind of intuitively move the parameters to where they need to be. Yeah, and uh, another good piece of advice on, the, on that front is uh, apply EQ and compression when something is wrong. You know, that's that's yeah, a really really yeah. important one one to me. I, I think people, and this is what I mean by uh, by learning to use use your tools properly is people often uh, mistake what the actual function of a certain kind of processing is. So you know, say for example with compression, people might use compression because they want something to sound really huge or something. You know, uh, and say something I noticed with <laughs> something I would recommend to Ableton users. Uh, is to turn off the auto gain makeup on your compressors if you use the Ableton compressor, yeah, for example. Yeah. Because what you do with the Ableton compressor is you pull that threshold down and the auto gain just cranks it up and suddenly you've got this sound that's much louder than it was to begin with. And, and, you, go, and oh, you, yeah. you think it sounds better, but it, yeah, it yeah, doesn't. But, um, <laughs> what it's actually doing is is suppressing the sound, the sound yeah. if anything. Uh, so another thing I would actually suggest to people is uh, if you want to have like a really loud mix, you know, if, if you're, if you, if you've got a situation where, you know, you have a lot of stuff happening in your mix and you're mastering it yourself, for example, and you're, you're trying to get it to be a certain loudness, but it's just falling short and you feel like you're pushing up against the glass ceiling. Uh, what you can do is actually construct the mix kind of back to front or I, I call it like a top down mix where you actually basically um, do this kind of like, muting things out like I was sort of talking about before and bringing things back in one by one and just get like your kick and your bass, maybe even, maybe even just your kick and your bass playing at the same time and do your loudness then. So, and you'll find that if you just have something that extraordinarily simple as a kick and a bass, um, you'll be able to go into your limiter and you'll be able to, you'll be able to just, you know, effortless, effortlessly amplify and limit stuff up to like whatever point you need and you can use that as a basis to then bring everything else back in and, and reconstruct the mix with that loudness on. And that's a, that's a really good way of basically getting that whole situation out of the way right at the start. Uh, because if you have that loudness, just when those two things are playing, like you, it'll, you'll keep it the whole, like, and you construct the rest of the mix around that. Um, you'll keep that loudness the whole time. So you would, you would start by mixing your kick and your bass, chuck on say a limiter on the master, uh, pull the threshold down until you get, some gain reduction and then yep. bring more elements in. And I assume that you adjust the threshold as you do that. Um, often you don't even have to, okay. this, this, this is the weird thing is, is uh, it's not like that. It's not like from that point on you have, it's not like the kick and the bass have taken up all of the space that there is in the sound space, it's, yeah. you know? Yeah. And this is the weird thing is that usually that loudness comes from, you know, the, the relation between the kick and the bass. So, I mean, it's definitely, um, <laughs> it's quite an unorthodox way of doing it, but, uh, I generally find that, you know, I, I'm never sort of, 
as opposed to the other way of, of, of mixing the whole track down and then applying all this loudness to it afterwards, um, I find that actually this way is much more natural. You know, you, you still find a place for everything in the mix as you would. You, and you, you definitely might need to adjust, you know, your thresholds a little bit. Um, and you might actually lose, a, you might lose like a couple of like 0.2 dB of loudness or something as you put the rest of the mix back together. But um, yeah, it basically just sets the precedent for, uh, how much space you actually have to fill up somehow, you know, with the loudness, you know, it's, and it, it seems to sort of really fill the available space and it sets a kind of sound stage for the, for all of the other place elements to be placed basically. Yeah. It's a super interesting approach. I'll have to, I'll have to give it a go. Um, cool. Got a few quick questions before we finish off. Uh, do you have any books or resources that have helped you become a better producer? They don't have to be music books necessarily. Uh, one I would suggest is Mixing With Your Mind by Michael Stavro, I think his name is. Yeah, uh, great book. And yeah, it's, it's a little bit old fashioned in some ways. Like, you know, when he talks about doing the EQs and stuff, I think he's using sort of a big SSL mixing desk or whatever, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, stuff like that. I don't, I don't agree with all of it. You know, some, uh, some of his techniques I'm not quite 100% sure about, such as, you know, one of the things he says, he says about EQ is you listen to the sound and then you do the EQ with this, with the, with it switched off as you imagine it needs to be done and then switch it on and see if that uh. processing is right. I'm not, I think that's a little bit, I, I can't get behind that, Yeah. but yeah. so much of the other stuff that he says, you know, about, uh, how, how to tell when your speakers are placed right in the room, you know, he talks about the ghost between the speakers where if you've got your speakers set up in a really ideal listening position and you're in the sweet spot, and you turn everything to mono, the sound should sound like it's coming from at some point between the speakers as if it's coming out of thin air. That's, you know, it just, it's just a lot of stuff like that. You know, he talks about using hard mics for soft voices and soft mics for hard voices when you're recording, how to get the best sounds out of it. And just all, all of this kind of mix theory. Um, there's another video online that I can't remember. Oh, I can't remember what it's called. It's, it's something Gibson. Um, I know, I know we're on air and everything, but I'm going to Google it really quick because it's, uh, it's yeah. absolutely hilarious. <laughs> it's uh, basically like a video from the 80s. And um, this guy he's, who is like explaining all of these mixed concepts to you. I think I've seen um, it. I think I've yeah, come across. Yeah. It's quite a, a few hours long, maybe two. Yeah, it's, it's about two and a half hours long. Yeah, and yeah, uh, yeah he's, uh, he's, got a, he's got a mullet and he's got this, he, yes. this moustache. And... Uh, <laughs> He's got all of these actors in there. I, I, yeah, I'm, I, might, I might not be able to find it. I'll, I'll leave a link to it in the uh, show notes so people can find it. Yeah, that would be... Oh, here it is. It's called The Art of Mixing by David Gibson. That's it, and, yeah. Um, that is a, it, it's a, it really is a really cool way of explaining uh, how you kind of have this cube shaped kind of sound space between your speakers and uh, the different types of processing you can apply to move things around in that space. Uh, and, uh, if, even if you don't get much use out of it in terms of learning stuff, it's, it's hilarious just to watch <laughs> <laughs> like the crazy trippy effects they have in it and stuff like that. Um, and the, the, the last one I would, I would recommend for mixing is Pensado's place, uh, yes. Dave Pensado's podcast. Cause that's, it's just like this, you know, it's just talking about cool ways to make stuff sound cool. And it's, and it's a very, very high profile lineup of, of people coming on the show. Yeah. Super fun to watch as well. Uh, I find very relaxed yeah uh okay what plugins or pieces of gear have you been digging recently um i'm loving x for records serum yes um that is just it's the next evolution of of software synthesizers basically you know between the wavetables and like the great built-in effects and all the, the way everything can just be routed to anything else and it's got a super straightforward interface um it's very low cpu it's fantastic you can drag your own sounds into the software and then turn that into a, into a wavetable and turn it and mangle it into some completely new sound. Um, I use Omnisphere all the time and I'm going to upgrade to Omnisphere too soon because that's actually another, another feature that they've just added as well is that you can also, you know, make sounds out of completely new sounds out of, out of sounds you already have. Mm. Um, and what it really excited me about Omnisphere too is how, you can say search for presets just like this one. So if you if you have a sound in your mix that isn't quite right, it'll you can do a search for similar kind of sounding sounds, which I think is really cool. Wow! Um, I use a ton of Native Instruments stuff as well. I think that's that's pretty kind of straightforward, really. Yeah. Like mainly Massive and FM8 stuff like that. Um, I use the 
the glue compressor every now and then by Satomic, although I've got to say that for my final mixes, I generally use the Logic compressor more than anything else because it's great. You know, uh, yeah, yeah. as far as software compressors go, it's, it's versatile enough to do pretty much anything you need to do. Um, I don't really have any gear. I'm not really much of a sort of, I do everything in the box, but uh, if I were to have any piece of gear in the world, I think I would want a Korg Kronos. I don't know if you've seen that, but it's like I a, think I, have. I, I had it. Yeah. Yeah. I, ha- I had like a, an old synthesizer like that, like a long time ago. And yeah. um, basically uh, the Kronos is uh, it's not, not, not only is it sort of weighted with, with proper keys, like a, like a, like a real piano is, um, or, or it's got a very real piano feel to it at least. Uh, but it also has like an SSD hard drive in it and all of these kind of sampler instruments built into it. And so apparently, you know, playing the piano on that is, is kind of the closest thing to playing a real piano that you're going to have with a synthesized instrument. And, uh, yeah, it just looks immense in terms of the, the sounds and stuff like that. So I think that would be fun for inspiration. Um, I suppose, the, uh, sort of- I suppose the price tag is immense as well. Yeah, <laughs> it <laughs> certainly is. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Uh, what, if you could collaborate with one person, anyone it doesn't have to be a producer, could be a vocalist, uh, who would it be? Um, I think vocalist wise, I think I would produce with Imogen Heap, uh, because yeah. not that she needs a producer, she can do it all herself. <laughs> um, yeah, like, cause she, you know, she's just such an inspiration in terms of, um, you know, cause she, she sings in a way that is designed to be sort of processed. You know, she, she, mm-hmm. she does, she does vocals in such a way that, you know, you obviously couldn't do, um, just with your, with your voice normally. And when she performs live, you know, she sings along with kind of looped and repeated and affected versions of her own voice and stuff. And, you know, I think that'd be a really, really cool experience. Um, I think Maddie would be, would be a cool person to do a tune with too, you know, uh, cause yeah. his, everything he does is just kind of so immense. In fact, it'd be kind of cool to do a tune with, with both of them at the same time. You know? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> that would be incredible. Yeah. Uh, any last words for the listeners? Um, well, okay. This is not my own advice, but rather advice I've heard on a number of other podcasts lately. And that is, uh, don't limit yourself in terms of the size of your dreams and, and what you think you're capable of, you know, uh, there's nothing really stopping you from continually expanding and improving and it may take a long time, but ultimately like the bigger that you can dream, the better you'll do for yourself. So yeah, dream bigger, basically. Great advice. Uh, well, thanks heaps for coming on. And finally, where can people find you online? Uh, for more info about myself as an artist, you can head over to jtechmusic.com. <laughs> I say this all the time on my radio show. It's so easy <laughs> to spread along. Or over at soundcloud.com forward slash jtechmusic where you can hear all my latest tunes. Uh, you can stream the whole album on there now. Um, or just basically, if you know, as far as checking out the music goes, all the new stuff is, is on iTunes and Spotify and all the usual places. 